How do you do? Jen and Cam feel it would be unkind to present this program without a friendly word of warning. We are about to unfold our true crime podcast, a podcast of lifelong friends who seek to examine crimes which were committed without reckoning upon God. The discussion will be frank, and the subject matter will be of a grim and violent nature. I think it will thrill you. It might even horrify you. So, if there are young children listening, or if you feel unwilling to subject your nerves to such a strain, now is your chance to... Well, we've warned you. Hey, Jen. Hey, Cam. How are you? I'm, I'm doing pretty okay, considering. Well, good. You know, good. Three-day weekend this weekend. So, you know, what did I do? Uh, I did nothing. Okay. Yeah, there I said it. Nothing. I didn't do anything. Really. We went to buy my daughter a new computer or a new laptop because hers ate dirt. Oh, okay. And so she's been using my laptop. So that's been fun. And mm-hmm. Thank goodness we had our good friend E.J. Hammond send us a script. Well, actually, I asked her if she could help out, and she did. Well, she actually, came in, she probably she came in clutch. Let's be honest. And yes, she did. She did. I was thinking, you know, with everything going on with you going back to school, it might be best to have some backup scripts just in case you know something couldn't happen. Mm-hmm. If you couldn't write, because you know I'm a very slow writer. And lucky for me, it came in just in time because I couldn't research anything because my, well, I could research on my phone, but I mm-hmm. just can't. So well, I'm excited, Jen. Let's dig right in. Okay. All right. Shall we go? Let's go. What do we think of when we hear the word mother? Most of us think of someone who exhibits unconditional love, safety, and security. We conjure up an image of a teacher, a disciplinarian, and a friend. For many women, becoming a mother is the ultimate goal upon entering adulthood and marriage. And the idea is so deeply embedded into our society that a concept of a mother causing harm to her offspring, or anyone else really, in her care, is shocking and disturbing. I'd agree. I think that's probably the worst. Oh. I say that a lot, but I on the hierarchy of... Types of evil, that's got to be way up there. Mm-hmm. Mary Ann Holder hadn't always had the easiest life. She was born out of wedlock in June of 1975, when it was still frowned upon in the southern United States, especially in a religious community. Her mother, Frankie, already had two sons, and after years of her husband's philandering, she had an affair outside the marriage. The father was a good friend on whom Frankie thought she could rely on during her time of need. And she told him that she was pregnant with his child. Then a short time later, she divorced her abusive husband to be with this man. But then she found out that he was equally just as dysfunctional. Isn't that weird how we are attracted to sort of the same sort of person? Like each person is attracted. Do you know what I mean? So like she Mm -hmm. was with the cheater. She found a new guy. Thought he was better. And he's still a cheater. You know what I mean? Well, I don't know if he was actually a cheater, but he was not. The man that she originally thought he was, I guess. Okay. He was just as bad as, or I got a, you. a different type of bad. Yeah. Or I shouldn't say he was bad. He was bad for her because there I really go. don't know if he was bad. Yeah, I got you. We know what we're talking about. You know what I'm saying? We do. But I think other people, like if you don't know us, like in our world, bad, we know what that is supposed to stand for. Just, you know what I'm saying? But mm-hmm. the outsider listening probably does not. Right. Whatever. Half the time we don't know what we're talking about. So we just kind of leave it very broad so it covers everything. <laughs> I would say it's more than half the time we don't know what we're talking about, but <laughs> everybody that listens to us knows. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Frankie found herself raising three children on her own and held out little hope of finding a man who would be interested in marrying her. Her prayers were answered when James Holder came into her life and wanted to be a part of it, children and all. In fact, He wanted her children to be his, so he adopted Frankie's two boys and Marianne and raised them both as his own. They were a tight family who attended church most Sundays 
and shared meals together during the week. Growing up outside of Greensboro, North Carolina, Marianne made friends easily. One day she heard classmate Beth Hunt singing on the bleachers at school and quickly decided they would be friends. In fact, Beth and Marianne became best friends for years to come. Finding they had a lot in common, the two girls became inseparable, and they did all the things that preteen girls in the 1980s did. They spent the night at each other's houses, they shared secrets, they attended church services together. Beth and Marianne remained best friends throughout the years, and they shared laughter and tears, and they raised their children together. They just were inseparable. Like us. Like it said earlier. Exactly like us. Mm Kind of. While Mary Ann spent time at Beth's house, she got to know Beth's older brother, Robert Rocky Smith. How can you resist a man named Rocky? <laughs> and then, and you would totally fall for Rocky, too, Camille, because he was a musician. Of course I would. And it's oh, almost Lord. impossible for a young girl not to be attracted. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? The petite, raven-haired Mary Ann drew Rocky's attention as well, and they started dating in high school. Marianne was 15 and Rocky was 17, and it didn't take long for Marianne to become pregnant with Rocky's child. And she was terrified to tell her mother for fear of the repercussions she would receive. She, because she was, Marianne was raised on going to church, and she had always been taught that abstinence was her only path until marriage, which a lot of us are taught that. She had no idea that her mother had already guessed her predicament two weeks earlier, and though she wasn't thrilled, she embraced her daughter with open arms. Because she's a mom. That's what we do. Mm Mm-hmm. Frankie Holder was disappointed in the teenagers, but when Rocky asked for permission to marry her daughter, she relented and the two were wed. And shotgun weddings have always been common in small towns, and like most underage mothers... Mary Ann dropped out of high school to raise her child, but she did later return to get her GED. The young couple lived with Rocky's parents on Coco Drive in Greensboro, North Carolina, in the house where Rocky had been raised. Their first child, Christina, came along, and two sons quickly followed. They were named Dylan and Zach. However, by the time Zach was born, the marriage had soured. Rocky and Mary Ann came to the conclusion that divorce was the only option. Years later, Rocky mentioned that the two of them were too much alike and conceded that they had been married far too young to have had a successful long-term marriage. Despite their split, they remained on good terms for the sake of their three children. Smith later said, quote, I can't say anything bad about Marianne. I don't know anyone who could. In the meantime, Marianne's best friend Beth married Brian Settles and they settled into an unstable relationship. Brian was fighting a battle with drug addiction that often led to violence against his wife. Beth's health was already fragile, but the physical abuse made it worse. Their two children, Ricky and Hannah Lee, were eventually allowed to live with Mary Ann in an effort to remove them from the stressful home environment, which is amazing. Just shows you what a great friend Mary Ann mm-hmm. and Beth were to each other. It takes a lot to take somebody's young kids into your home. I'd do it for you. I'd do it for you, too. And I'd apologize to you for having to have mine. Oh, I would apologize to you. That's another story. It's totally different podcast. Yep. Shortly after Beth gave birth to their third child, a girl named Cheyenne, Beth was taken back to the hospital for breathing issues. Sadly, she died a few days later on March 9th, 2011. (gasps) Beth died? Beth died. I did not see that coming. Now I'm kind of sad. Okay. Marianne was heartbroken. She posted this comment to an online message board. Quote, Beth, for the past 25 years, I have been there for you, and I will continue to be there for your kids. Always. Marianne opened her home to Cheyenne and prepared to get temporary custody of the little girl. She had made a promise to Beth that she would raise all three of her children, and she intended to keep that promise. Now, prior to all these events, a friend of the family bought the house where Marianne and Rocky spent their first part of their marriage. And luckily enough, a friend rented it to her. So she was living in the same house that she did prior, which is kind of nice. Mm-hmm. By 2011... Marion's daughter, Christina, had moved out of the house, but there were still four children living there, including Dylan and Zach, and then Marianne's niece, Hannah Lee, 
and then her nephew, Ricky. Yeah. Marianne had temporary custody of Hannah Lee and Ricky, but she was also working towards custody of Cheyenne, who was only a few months old at the time. While all of this was going on, Marianne also invited her niece by marriage, Michaela, to move in. Now, Michaela was in a blood relative. She didn't have enough people there? Seriously? Thank you. She's Lord. Michaela was in a blood relative of Mary Ann or her children. Her mother was married to Mary Ann's half-brother, James Holder, making her James Holder's stepdaughter. So, like the other children with Mary Ann, Michaela's home life was very unstable. Mary Ann couldn't stand to think of her 15-year-old living in an untenable situation, so she stepped up to allow her to live in her home. In fact, Michaela always loved visiting Mary Ann's house. It was where she felt safe, although there was another reason she was happy to move in. After Michaela moved in, something became obvious. She and her step-cousin Dylan, who is now 17 years old, were instantly taken with one another. Uh-oh. I was worried you were going to say that. Mm. Since they weren't blood-related, they were allowed to continue the relationship, even mm. while they were living in the same house. See, yeah, that's the problem right there. Nope. Mm-hmm. That's, that's going to be a hard no for me, dog. Though it didn't thrill Dylan's father, Rocky sat his son down and talked about responsible behavior and safe sex. The older man spoke from direct experience, having been a young father himself. In fact, Michaela and Dylan were the same ages, 15 and 17, that Marianne and he had been when they found themselves pregnant. Still, there didn't seem to be much made out of the fact that, by law, the two teens were related. Though it seems overwhelming... Marianne's ultimate goal was to have a total of six children in the house after the court cases were finalized. For a single mother working a temporary office assistant job, finances were stretched to the limit, no doubt causing a great deal of daily stress. The family spent a lot of time at their local church and found a great deal of strength in its teachings. In the South, the role the church plays in the lives of its members can be all-encompassing. Families grow up socializing together and supporting one another. Many of the outings in which families engage involved other church members and church-oriented events. Mary Ann and the children in her care were active in the church and volunteered a lot of their time there. Something else the church does is it places a lot of expectations on church members, particularly in more conservative denominations. Young women learn to be a wife and mother is paramount and they're expected to shoulder the great deal of the child-rearing of their offspring. This explains why Marianne may have felt a great deal of pressure to be the perfect caretaker. Taking in so many children who weren't her responsibility and adding stress to her daily life, including the various custody cases within the court system. Her identity was wrapped up in motherhood and fulfilling the expectations others had of her. Though Marianne never intended to fall in love with a married man, she began an affair with Randall Lamb after meeting him at the Pleasant Garden Community Center in 2008. The two worked on the board of directors together, and a romance was inevitable. The relationship lasted for at least two years, and then, of course, there's sources that differ on the time frame. Not all sources are, you know, correct. A little faulty sometimes. So we're guesstimating at least two years. They eventually ended it when Randall's wife, Jennifer, found out about it. Randy tried to break things off with Mary Ann in an attempt to save his marriage, but Mary Ann was angry at Randy's wife. In fact, Mary Ann was so upset that she began harassing Jennifer, sending her nude photos of herself, texting and emailing her constantly. And the situation became so volatile that both women took out restraining orders on one another. Jennifer's restraining order alleged that Quote, Mrs. Holder continues to call cell phones belonging to me, also called my home, sent text messages and email, including naked pictures of herself, and follows me and my children. Unquote. Yeah. It also said, quote, if we go to the mall, she shows up, movies and stores. She also moved her son to my son's school to be near my family. <gasps> and recently she tried to run me off the road and follow me down Elm Street. That's terrible. Holy cow. When Jennifer Lamb threatened to sue Marianne for alienation of affection to the tune of 250000 Marianne became distraught. Marianne's restraining order alleged that, quote, Randy Lamb called her 100 times in a few days, 
and drove by her house 10 times. It also noted that Randy told her that, quote, he will stop his wife from filling the alienation of affection lawsuit, but if not, he was going to enjoy his new car that I pay for, unquote. Now, presumably, with the money that Jennifer Lamb would have won from Marianne, Mm -hmm. if she would have won the lawsuit, that's what it meant, that he would drive the car that her money would buy for, right? Does that make sense? Totally. She's messed up. Well, it's a shitty thing for him to say, too, because it takes two to tango, boys and girls. Sure do. Marianne put up no trespassing signs in her yard, but both restraining orders expired when neither women showed up to court to keep them in place. Let's talk about the alienation of affection lawsuit, right? It's not very common. Only six states have this law. North Carolina, Hawaii, Mississippi, New Mexico, South Dakota, and Utah. Hmm. I didn't know that. I just assumed that was something that you could claim and file it in any state. Exactly. Well, you probably could, but nobody'd care. Just only these states did. The lawsuit seeks to award monetary compensation if a third party is found guilty of breaking up a marriage. An alienation of affection lawsuit can be filled if the facts of a third party cause one person to lose the affection of his or her spouse. Now, do you believe mari- in that? Do you think that that should be a thing? Not really, because like I said before, it takes two. See, I, I feel the exact same way. It is. I mean, hold on. you're a responsible adult. If somebody else tempts you, you can't blame or not even tempt you. You know what I mean? I think it would be it's, more that you sue the spouse after divorce or whatever, right? You know what you I'm saying? S- yeah, I would think it would be yeah, more the on the spouse than, yeah. yeah. Okay, go ahead. I was just checking. Okay. The married partner who was wronged can sue their spouse's lover for taking away the attention of their spouse, basically. So there are three things that the plaintiff must show in order to prove their alienation of affection. They have to prove that their marriage, that there was a marriage with existing love and affection. The love and affection was destroyed. And by the wrongful, intentional acts of the third party, right? So they have to prove that there was Mm -hmm. a marriage and that the marriage was very loving and that that bitch Marianne came in and took it. No, (laughs) not that. And that some other person destroyed it all. I mean, I guess Marianne might not be a good person. I'm starting to put that together. It's difficult to tell whether the Lambs would have been able to win this lawsuit. But the court case would have totally destroyed Marianne's attempts to gain custody of Cheyenne Suttles, and that could have been enough to push Marianne. By attempting to get temporary custody of the baby Cheyenne Suttles, the alienation of affection lawsuit could raise questions about Marianne's ability to care for the baby. So in a misguided attempt to stall for time, she wrote a $10,000 check to the Lambs hoping to have the lawsuit retracted in time for her custody hearing. Really? It was a check she knew that would bounce, and it was just a feeble attempt to try to stall the legal proceedings. Right. We're also seeing a woman who was distraught over the breakup of what she thought had been a loving relationship. She noted in her restraining order that Randy Lamb told her he would try to get his wife to stop the lawsuit. But if not, he would enjoy the car that her money would buy him. Considering the more than two years they shared together, it must have been painful to hear that he wanted nothing more to do with her and that he was essentially laughing at her pain. Yeah, that's terrible. Just with everything that's going on, I'm sure, you know, trying to win custody of kids and then your husband's cheat. I get all that. You're bound trying to, to win like, custody of your best friend's yeah, daughter. Yeah, just it's, baby. Yeah, it's a lot. Plus the stress of having all the kids in the house, yes. the stress of the two kids that the affair. may or may, yeah, and yeah. just the whole thing. Yeah. And another thing that's just shitty is he's involved in the affair too. But now, and he's, but like now you he's, said, he's, he's done with it. So she And his wife to... is trying so hard to keep on to this marriage when it's obvious that it might not be as strong as she thinks she is. Despite Mary Ann being in an existing relationship where these restraining orders were taken out, Mary Ann continued to suffer the consequences for her forbidden romance, knowing she couldn't talk with anyone about it beyond what she alleged in her restraining orders. Within the early months of 2011, Mary Ann began a relationship with David Stokes. 
Though little details of their relationship were known, he was aware of Marianne's legal issues with the Lambs and tried to listen when she talked about the situation. He assured her that the Lambs wouldn't be able to win the case, but she was distraught and unconvinced. David was pretty, how do you say, he was committed to Marianne, and he could really see a future with her, and he hoped that they would grow old together. The weekend before the event that changed everyone's life, Marianne and her children went swimming with a friend at an indoor pool. Her friend noted that Marianne seemed, quote, a little tired, but showed no signs of stress. But she is tired. She had spent over $200 in groceries for the household that same day. But she was calm, said the friend who was the last one to see her. November 19th, 2011, 14-year-old Zach was allowed to spend the night at his friend's Nick's house. In the early hours of November 20th, 2011, using a 38 caliber pistol, Marianne shot Dylan, Michaela, Ricky, and Hannah Lee in the head as they slept. <gasps> no, I just got goosebumps. That's terrible. Hearing no sound from any of them, she confirmed a meeting with Randy. The second meeting in as many days, she drove to Guilford Tech Community College Aviation Center in Greenboro. Arriving before 8.52 a.m., and there are no details about the reason behind the meetings at all. So she left those babies in their bed dead and went to go meet Randall? Mm-hmm. They had a prior meeting scheduled. Unbelievable. But what, what, but what we don't know. And she arrived there about 8.52 a.m. As she exited her black Ford Explorer... Marianne shot Randy in the arm and the elbow before he managed to escape and immediately drove home. What? On the way, he contacted his wife, who called the police and explained what had happened. Police arrived at Marianne's home on Coco Drive at about 9.30 a.m., hoping to speak with her, but she wasn't home, so they waited outside. I hope they sent other people elsewhere. I hope they didn't just sit there. What the police didn't know was that Mary Ann was picking up her youngest son, Zach, who had spent the night with a friend the night before, which a scary thought is his friend Nick, who he had the sleepover with, was originally supposed to spend the night with Zach that night, but for some reason plans got changed. So I'm sure the parents were now wondering how things might have been different if Nick had actually stayed the night with Zach. So Nick was supposed to stay with Zach, and instead Zach stayed with Nick, or did they not even stay? Yes. Okay, so Nick Zach- stayed the night. So when the police got to Mary Ann's house, she wasn't home because she was picking up Zach from Nick's place. And then Mary Ann was intending to drive back to her home to complete what she started earlier in the house. So arriving between 1015 and 1030, she noted the police presence around her home and turned her SUV around, hoping to leave the scene, to flee, to leave, Right, because she knew what she did. And Zach's in the car with her still? He's alive at this point? Zach's in, the, Zach's in the car with her. Okay. Police saw her vehicle, and the officer gave chase. She turned into a dead-end road off Coco Drive and stopped, then almost immediately shot Zach in the head. <gasps> As her car idled, Deputy H.N. Sampson of the Guilford County Sheriff's Department pulled up behind her and activated his blue lights. As he exited his vehicle, he saw a puff of smoke from the driver's side window. Checking inside, he found Marianne deceased and Zach barely clinging to life. Um, That is terrible. Heart-wrenching. Just heart-wrenching. After emergency personnel was summoned to the scene... Police entered the house on Coco Drive, discovering Dylan Smith dead and the other three children suffering from life-threatening injuries. Zach Smith was taken from the SUV to the hospital in critical condition. Within the week, all five children would die. (gasps) Oh, I was really hoping one of them made it at least. Mm -hmm. Police later noted that all of the victims had been shot in the head, including Marianne. Police found cocaine in Marianne's vehicle, but her autopsy only located caffeine in her system. No connection with cocaine use was ever linked to Marianne, 
but it wouldn't be surprising if someone within all the burdens she carried might need something to increase her energy level, if you know what I mean. Just a little bump. Just a line. Wow. Maybe she was meeting Randall under the guise of giving him coke or something. She's probably going to kill him. <laughs> no, I know she's going to kill yeah. him. But I'm saying yeah. like, that maybe that's how she got. Because why would he meet her unless there's, do you see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. That would be right. interesting to know if, if he partaked in the coke. Right. And now, so, you know, true crime podcasts usually, you know, go about only talking about the killer a lot. But let's it's easy to forget that the victims in a crime like this were more than just someone's children. I mean, they basically were children. And these were individuals with dreams of a future, you know. They're babies. Um, they had their own personalities. And let's just take a little bit and talk about these five young people that lost their lives due to the actions of the woman who claimed to love them. That's awful. 17-year-old Dylan was the typical middle child, and he's been described as wise beyond his years. He was generous with his friends and hoped one day to become a Marine. He enjoyed playing baseball and loved watching basketball. He was preparing to attend college in the months to come, and he was ready to start his new life. Zach was the typical youngest child, full of himself and opinionated. He was an extrovert, and his friends thought of him as a ladies' man. Zach liked to fish and was involved in sports. He seemed to always be up to something, but he had a big heart and loved everyone. Zach and Dylan were close, and ever the younger brother, Zach teased his older brother about the women he dated. Ricky Suttles. Ricky was the eldest child of Brian and Beth Suttles. He tended to be quiet, but he was kind. He loved playing Xbox and liked throwing Frisbee around with his friends. He was a volunteer at school and hoped to graduate high school early to take classes at the local community college. Ricky had always been protected of his younger sister, Hannah Lee. And Hannah Lee settles. Hannah Lee loved playing Xbox with her big brother, Ricky. She was smart and talented. She joined the drama club at church and was always singing and dancing. She was energetic. She loved to smile and adored out horses. Michaela Woods. Michaela was both pretty and smart. She was related to Marianne's family only through marriage. Remember, she was the stepdaughter of Marianne's half-brother. Mm -hmm. And despite living with him, she was also dating Dylan at the time of their deaths. Now, all these children had a bright future and deserved to have a chance to achieve their dreams, which I just... It's heartbreaking. The devastation Marianne left behind was immeasurable. Marianne's family and friends struggle with putting back the pieces of their lives. No one was able to reconcile the cold murderer with the loving, warm woman they knew. Memorials were held for the victims, but it was hard to grieve for the children and not for Marianne. Though her actions were the cause of their grief, some cried for the woman they thought they knew. She had done a horrible thing, but they felt that she'd only done it out of desperation. Sadly, they would never get the answers they so badly needed to resolve their pain and anguish. Police initially suspected that Marianne had planned to kill her eldest child, Christina, who resided with her husband and child at the time. However, there is little, if any, evidence for this. It's true that she had written two worthless checks to Christina two days prior to the murders, but she hadn't presented them to her, nor did she have them with her when she committed the killings. It lends credence to the theory that Marianne was only concerned about taking her dependent children with her into the afterlife because she wasn't there to care for them. She didn't believe anyone else would, which is so silly. Another theory is that she was going to give Christina the checks to exchange for taking custody of Cheyenne from Christina, and that's where the baby had been living. Oh. And to take her to the afterlife with her as well. So basically that she thought that maybe she'd go to Christina's house and kill Cheyenne and Christina. Oh. Oh, you know what? She very well may have if they didn't, you know, pull her over right. and, and catch her. Well, she was on her way home. Yeah, but yeah, that's not... Yeah, I get what you're saying. Taken the boy inside and killed him inside and then left and... Yeah. Now, Christina, who is Marianne's only surviving child, now cares for Cheyenne Settles along with her own son, Tristan. Though it may be a small consolation to the family... Dozens of people's lives were improved by the organs and tissues donated from the victims. It's doubtful that anyone in Marianne's family realized that she was planning suicide or even that she was depressed. 
it's hard to tell when people are depressed. Some people... They hide it really well. They hide it so well. Certainly they knew about her troubles with the lambs and the restraining orders. They realized she was dealing with a difficult situation, but on the outside, she showed no indication that she would act out violently. However, suicide without warning is not uncommon. Quote, Many people who commit suicide do so without letting on that they are thinking about it or planning on it, says Dr. Michael Miller, assistant professor of psychiatry at the Harvard Medical School. The decision to commit suicide might be made just minutes or hours before that act. Though one might ask if Marianne exhibited psychopathic traits when she murdered her family, it's highly unlikely that this was a case. She was clearly suffering from a great deal of emotional stress and probably compartmentalized her feelings toward her ex-boyfriend up until finally making the decision to take the children in her care to be with her in heaven. It's far more likely that she was dealing with depression after her best friend died, dealing with the stress of the court system and getting custody of Beth's children, and the after-effects of her breakup with Randy Lamb. Feelings of hopelessness and being trapped can be exacerbated over time. Harvard Health notes that people who commit suicide are often, quote, sparked by intense feelings of anger, despair, hopelessness, or panic. Things that can put someone at a higher risk of suicide can include a personal crisis, especially if it increases a sense of isolation. Mary Ann's best friend, Beth, just died about eight months earlier and left behind her three children. Now, if we look at the definition of a spree killer, it's obvious that Marianne Holder fits the bill. A spree killer is someone who kills two or more victims in a short time. The U.S. Bureau of Justice noticed that a spree killer must also be defined as killings at two or more locations with almost no time break between murders. There doesn't tend to be a cooling off period for spree killers. Of course, Mary Ann had to pick up her youngest son after killing her four children in the home because Zach was sleeping over at a friend's house, which could have caused the short break in the killings. And it's hard to determine if that period of time could have given Mary Ann the time needed to decide against killing Zach. But it's clear that even if it were possible, it didn't happen. Mm. It's important to consider that spree killers often experience various stressors that lead to them responding in violence. Many spree killers indicate feeling wronged by someone or by society. In both of her suicide notes, Marianne used that exact wording to indicate the reasons for her act. She also fit another category of killer, those who commit filicide, or the deliberate act of a parent killing their own children. Altruistic filicide is defined as when a parent believes that the world is too cruel for the child, whether this is actually occurring or not. And in an altruistic filicide, a mother kills her child out of love. She believes death to be the child's best interest. Which is so heartbreaking. It is, but then it's also like, why did she try to go kill her ex-lover Randy? That was to make other people suffer. Well, we don't know that for sure, but we're thinking that it's for sure she shot him. She shot mm-hmm. him twice. But if but out. if she loved him, if she loved him, she was going to take him and well, have him forever. She was mad at him, though. She was I mad know. at him. I she was hurt. Yeah, but come on. That's just so wrong. For Marianne to have killed these five children in such a measured, cold way, she probably felt that there was no other way out and that she would meet them in the afterlife to continue to protect them there. It's likely that she felt numb when she committed the murders, making it easier to end their lives and then to kill herself. Marianne was a religious individual who believed wholeheartedly in the afterlife. Perhaps believing the kids were going to heaven to be with her gave her consolation and put her actions into perspective. She may have worried that without being around, they would become orphans. Now, Marianne, she's been described as dedicated, hardworking, loving, and caring by various people who knew her. And she was seen by someone who worked hard to protect and provide for her children. Marianne doesn't seem to be your typical spree killer, right? She doesn't display antisocial traits, no McDonald triad. She was not a narcissist, nor was she a sadist. No one could have predicted that she would go on a killing spree that ended in six deaths. That said, what people don't see was a woman trying desperately to juggle a lot of stressful things in her life to afford five kids on her income, 
to process her relationship with another man, to gain custody of all three Suttles' children, avoid a lawsuit, and clearly those stressors culminated in Marianne's final violent acts. For someone who is a loving mother and caretaker, it's bizarre to see her seem to take a completely different direction into murdering those in her care. I think we have to try to see her way of thinking in a different way. By the time Marianne had decided to commit suicide, she was starting to wonder how her children in her home would survive without her around. After a lifetime of being part of a Christian church, we see a woman who strongly believed in an afterlife. It's quite possible that Marianne determined the best way for these children to exist without her on earth was to join her in heaven. It was a way for her to feel like they wouldn't suffer after she took her own life, and she may have bolstered her resolve, believing that they would all be together, happy, and without a care in the world. Although this is an unusual way of looking at things, many murderers find ways to compartmentalize their actions to fit them in their personal ethics. We know that Marianne was under a great deal of pressure to be a good parent and a good Christian. Despite how her church viewed suicide, she had clearly come to the end of her rope and could see no way out without the people she loved judging her. If she couldn't handle things to the top of their expectations, she figured there was no other reason for her to continue living. Marianne had always been a law-abiding, fun-loving, conscientious person who enjoyed volunteering at community events. She loved her children and enjoyed being around family and friends. She was thought of as a loyal friend and a generous giver. Her final actions baffled everyone who believed her and left a huge hole in the lives of her survivors. So the murders and suicides took place at three different places, but have only been in two locations if Jack hadn't stayed overnight at Nick's house. It even begs the question whether she would have gone after Randy if she had killed all five of the children in her house instead of having to go pick Zach up later. Maybe she felt like taking care of Randy was something she could do since she had to leave the house anyway. I'm just going to go to the store. Might as well swing around and kill Randy. Right. Right? No. Yeah. It's likely that Marianne tried to kill Randy because both Jennifer and he were the reason she was committing suicide and agitated enough to kill herself. She had this in her mind. If she would have killed all those babies in that house, she would have gotten in the car, went and killed him, then killed herself. That, I think, was her whole plan. Could have been. You would think he, she would try to leer, lure him into her house, though. I would yeah, think he, that would be the safest her. way. That's why I said the Coke. Because how else could you get somebody, you know... Yeah, but um, you wouldn't give him Coke. No, you um, would pretend it. Like, maybe he was a, he did Coke a lot. So she's like, listen, I got this Coke. You left him We're saying this allegedly. There's no yeah, proof we are. that we, he I'm just, I, you know... We're just trying to play... It. The Coke might be a red herring. Let's just say the Coke's a red herring. Okay. So we don't know for sure why it was there or why she had it. It could have been somebody totally... She could have been holding it for a friend, right? Right. Mm-hmm. Yep. So just a few facts about child murder. When a young child is murdered, the most frequent perpetrator is the victim's parent or step-parent. The U.S. has the highest rates of child homicide. How awful is that? That's shameful. American women are more likely than men to kill their children in association with suicide. A significant portion of filicides end in completed suicide by the mother. Only 10% of murder suicides are perpetrated by women. In 25% of the murder-suicide cases, there are more than one victim. Experts believe in some instances a killer's ego may not allow them to imagine that their victims or loved ones could go on without them. And that's it. I think this is a terribly horrific, I mean, just plain sad story. And obviously she was dealing with some mental distress that is out of this world. And no matter when anybody kills somebody or kills themselves, Something's not right, right? Mm -hmm. But I just keep thinking, putting myself in that spot, right? And I keep thinking about Beth and that she trusted her with her babies. And I don't know, that breaks my heart. I would be so, you know what I mean? Like, I just, there's other people that would have helped raise those kids. You didn't have to take out all of them. Right. But any of them. If Marianne was depressed and. No, I know that that was my whole (laughs) lead in. That you, I know that 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 is obviously. (laughs) That she was not well mentally. Right. right. And seriously, if she believed in the afterlife, she or whichever, she believed that she was, hopefully, we're thinking, we don't know, that she believed that it was best for everybody to go. 
you know, and I, and I would it have been that, or could it have been more of a thing where if nobody else will take them, or it could have been I'm, nobody else is going to get them. I don't want anybody else to take them. Exactly, yeah. and we'll never know. That's what's terrible. That's I don't know. I don't. It breaks my heart. She also leaves this as the final thought. Society doesn't necessarily teach constructive ways to deal with depression and disappointment either. We provide very little to support people at risk before they become violent. And this is, she got the quote from the Huffington Post. And I would also want to say this, if you feel depressed and are contemplating suicide or hurting yourself or others, please call the suicide hotline. And the number is one 800 Two seven three eight two five five. That was a really good job, Jen and EJ. Way a- to go, EJ. Yeah, amazing. I don't think I've ever. I don't know if I've really heard of that story. I don't know. I mean, yeah, I and don't. you would think it would be a lot more sensational, you know? Yeah, and it didn't since... happen that long ago. So no, wow. no. But EJ herself is from North Carolina, and She's not from South Carolina. She, she, no. The north one, the one on top. The one on top. And she's always been fascinated by, you know, serial crime and psychology behind it. Mm -hmm. She has a blog called The Confessions of a Bundy File. And she kind of has a unique perspective into the mind of Ted Bundy. Mm -hmm. And she's been featured in Bizarrepedia on some of the stuff on Ted Bundy. She also wrote season three of the true crime podcast criminology oh so now we're thrilled that she's had written for us too so very yeah. nice she's also currently working on a book with french author fabian richard featuring the voices of ted bundy's victims survivors and various law enforcement officials who interacted with him so the book's going to be published next year and it's right now it's the working title is ted bundy Memories of the Beast. We're going to put all this information on the show notes so you can find her on Twitter and Facebook. She's a really interesting lady to speak with. So, Plus, she makes me feel like a big loser because I've done nothing with my life. And then she just keeps adding stuff. But yeah, I know. She's fantastic. Awesome. We love it when our friends succeed. It's awesome. We do. But anyway, uh, thanks, EJ. We appreciate it. Very much so. All right, Jen. Good job. And so until next time, Jen, remember... Lock your doors. And keep passing by those open windows. Uh, bye bye Love you. When you said, what do you think of a mother and you paused, I was going to go, fuck her. <laughs> <laughs> but you came back too quick. Oh, uh, we should you should have done it and we could have just had the... Um... We'll start it all over and I'll do it again because like I okay. it was like a name game thing. Because you said, what? You know, sometimes I always ask you questions and then I pause for you to say something. So I thought okay. that's what you were doing with me. And I was going to go, fuck her. Well, we'll just do that and Nico can add it to the bloopers. It's kind of like an arranged blooper. How does it that is. sound? That's okay. fine. So I don't do it right now, right? We're just gonna continue. No, I'm I'm gonna do I'm gonna read the sentence right now and then you can do it. Oh, okay. 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 What do we think of when we hear the word mother? Fucker. Motherfucker. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. Oh, nice. I thought you I kiss thought your was... mama with that mouth? No. <laughs> I, I thought it was a word game. I thought you were being serious. Oh, okay. Go oh, ahead. okay. Yeah, but I do okay. be honest, when you say mother, I, that's what comes That's to what you think of? Kinda, yeah. I'm be honest. Yeah. Growing up outside of Greensboro, no. Th- Note Carolina. <laughs> Rocky Smith. How can you resist a man named Rocky? <laughs> and not only that. He's going to fight you for you. <laughs> no, he would. And you know what? <laughs> Mary Ann. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh. That goes at the back. It's fine. It's fine. <sighs> so the uh, <laughs> Camille's. For those of you that don't know, Camille is like the ultimate groupie. Marianne was raised on going to church, and she had always been taught that abstinence was her only path until marriage, which a lot of us are taught that. I was going to say a lot of us are abstinent. (laughs)
<laughs> whether yeah. we want to or not. <laughs> yeah. It's true. Okay, go ahead. And he conceded that they had, let me start that all over. Did he concede? In the beginning, he did. He conceded a lot of concessions. Did he concede his election? That's what word I think of when, you know. Okay, go ahead. Didn't Beth, isn't Beth the one that died in Little Women? Or, is, or was it Joe? Oh, I think it was Beth. Was it Beth? I thought Little it was Beth. Beth. I don't know. It might be a Little Joe. I forget. No, I, I know. Joe, at least. Joe, I think Joe was the strong one. Joe March. She was the, like, the main I need to watch the she? Francine. The new one is Pew. good. I watched it. I watched it. Now I'm gonna look well, it then up. you should know this. I know, but I watched it a while ago. I can't remember. Okay. Beth Aww, dies. Beth dies. Speech. She it's developed Beth. a devastating illness that brings the family back together. You're right. You it go. was Beth. I knew it. Sorry for the spoilers, people. Right, but sorry. yeah, I knew it was Beth. Okay. I read that in seventh grade. And just a little side note, I was reading it and it was on my desk during math class and it fell during a test. Mm. And it made this huge, because it was a hardback book that I got from home. And it fell on the floor and it made a huge noise and everybody in the room jumped. <laughs> and my oh. face turned bright red. And that's the first time I ever, the first and only time ever that I remembered being that embarrassed. Oh, boy. That's Seventh grade. I was yeah. like 12. Okay. You no, know, I also <clears throat> wondered how come little men didn't get the accolades little women got? And then I think because nobody wants to read a, a book about little men. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Size matters. Size matters. Right? And just the character <laughs> and everything. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. So Marianne never intended to fall in love with a married man. She began an affair with Randall Lamb. Which, I have to say, Randall Lamb, there is... Randall Lamb. Randall Lamb. Randall Lamb. Boom, boom, boom. Randall Lamb. Randall Lamb. Sorry. Randall Lamb immediately makes my head go to The Shining because it's Randall Flagg was the bad guy. Oh. So it's just Mine different. goes to a rock and roll music. I, I know. Ramda, lambda, lambda, lambda. Yeah. yeah. She likes those rock stars. Oh, okay. I told Hadley to simmer down one night. She's like, what? What does that mean, mom? What does simmer down mean? I mean, it means you to shut up. Oh. That's what it means. <laughs> now you're making me laugh again. Quit it. I'm sorry. Oh, shoot. Okay, go ahead. Which, by the way, on Twitter... Don't send me crotch shots. Thank you very much. I got some, uh, somebody, somebody friended me. Somebody friended us on face or on Twitter. Sorry. Somebody friended us on Twitter or followed us. And I always follow back. Um, and then overnight I get a text and I open it up and it is a woman's vagina. <laughs> <laughs> what? I don't want to see that. You go send that to the gynecology Twitter. You don't send it to True Crime Twitter. I also found out that our friend um, Nicole from True Crime or South Africa, True Tri our friend Nicole from True Crime South Africa also got the same pick. Are you kidding? Who is Dead that? serious. I don't know. Is that real? I, that has to I, be a bot, right? Like, no I, way. I quickly unfollowed them. them. A badge pick? No way. Oh, it was, yeah. It, it was, I saw her what god gave her well yeah you, unreal and of course the first thing i do in the morning is open it up so i'm like not look you know my glasses <laughs> are off and i'm like what is that <laughs> <laughs> not a good look in the morning that's not what i want to see i don't even want to look at mine you know <laughs> i don't want to look at yours moving on oh geez. all right sorry the lawsuit seeks to award monetary compensation if a third party if a third party is found guilty. <laughs> it's far more likely. It's far more li far more likely. 